Root locus is a graphical representation of the closed loop poles as a system parameters is changed. This is a powerful method of analysis and design for stability and transient response of any control system. Feedback control systems are difficult to comprehend from a qualitative point of view, and hence they rely heavily upon mathematics and the interpretation of equations. The root locus covered in this chapter is a graphical technique that gives us the description of a control system's performance that we are looking for and also serves as a powerful tool that yields more information than the methods already discussed in the previous lectures. Up to this point, gains and other system parameters were designed to yield the desired transient response for only first and second order systems. Even though the root locus can be used to solve the same kind of problem, its real power lies in the ability to provide solutions for systems of order higher than 2. For example, under the right conditions, a fourth order system's parameter can be designed to wield a given percent overshoot and settling time using the concepts learned in the previous lectures. The root locus can be used to describe the performance of a system as various parameters in the system are changed. For example, the effect of varying a control gain upon percent overshoot, settling time and peak time can be displayed in the root locus. Besides transient response, the root locus also gives a graphical representation of a system's stability. We can clearly see ranges of stability, ranges of instability, and the conditions that cause a system to break into oscillations. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the concepts of uncertainties in a control system, that is, what is the influence of a parameter that it changes over time, understand the applications of the root locus method, and apply the root locus method to a given system. The applications of root locus in control systems are endless. Here is one example. An aircraft closed loop roll angle controller must ensure that the response time is 1 second and the maximum overshoot is less than 15% for any input command. This is easy to design, provided that the function g of s, that is the transfer function, doesn't change over time. But what if some parameters in the transfer function change over time? Would the controller or would the design controller still perform in the same way if, for instance, the mass of the aircraft changes? This occurs in every flight. The weight of the aircraft when it departs and when it arrives is not the same because the aircraft is burning fuel. How does that affect the performance of the system? We can display the location of the poles for a varying parameter in the system using the root locus technique. In this example, we are requested to design a cruise speed controller for a high speed train. The mechanical team requires your controller to be overdamped so that acceleration and traction is minimized. How would the controller perform if friction between the wheels and the rail changes due to heat or snow, which is very likely to occur during operation? Or even, is the system stable if one of these parameters change? This can be seen in a root locus plot. The idea of root locus is to give a map of all possible location of poles as one of the parameters in the control systems is changed from zero to infinity. Up to this point, in order to evaluate the influence of a parameter of interest in the control system, we would have to compute the location of the pole for different values of that parameter. That parameter could be a control gain, or could be one parameter that belongs to the plant itself. The closed loop transfer function thus needs to be evaluated every time any parameter in the transfer function changes. That will give the location of the poles that when placed on the S-plane is specified the time response of the system as underdamped, overdamped, critically damped, marginally stable or even unstable. This would be a very complicated process when you have a parameter that can have a very large range of operation. The root locus is an alternative method for this sort of analysis. It will provide paths in the S-plane that represent the location of the poles as one of the parameters in the control system is changed from zero to infinity. As we have seen before, the location of the poles is what dictates the time response of a system. Consider this transfer function, the input r, the output is y. The model parameter k affects the location of the poles and therefore the response of the system to any input. What value of k should we choose to meet a system performance requirement? If the value of k isn't exactly as predicted, what is the effect of changing k on the system performance? If you use the tools that we developed in the past lecture, the only way to answer this question would be to find the location of poles for every value of k and then plot the location of poles individually for all values of k as we see here. Creating this map would be tedious because for every point on the S-plane, we need to solve for the location of poles in the transfer function as for a given value of that parameter k. And this is the idea of the root locus, is to create these paths that represent where the poles are going as k changes from zero to infinity. And when you look at the root locus map, we can now say exactly in which range the system is overdamped, underdamped, or even unstable by simply looking at where the poles go 
for a given value of k. This also allows us to design a controller that will meet some requirements. For instance, if the damping ratio must be within a certain range or must be greater than a given value to limit oscillations, we know that at the pose of the closed loop transfer function will have to be placed within a certain region. If the settling time is to be minimized, we want the pose to be placed in another region. If the performance requires a natural frequency to be limited, we want the pose to be limited to a given range in the S-plane. This can all be seen in the root locus. Let's just start with a very simple example. Consider the following closed loop system. The plant G of S is to be controlled using a proportional gain K. The input is R and the output is Y. The closed loop transfer function is simply K times G divided by 1 plus K times G. And the characteristic equation, which is the denominator of the transfer function, is simply 1 plus kg equals to 0. Solutions to this equation represent the value of s that will make the transfer function tend to infinity, and hence this also represents the poles of the closed loop transfer function. Notice that the poles now depend on the value of k. If now k is changed from 0 to infinity, where would the poles go on the s plane? Now let's replace that function g of s with 1 over s times s plus 1, and the parameter k now becomes a. A is the parameter that the designer can control. The characteristic equation here is 1 plus A times G of S, that is 1 over S times S plus 1. And you can write this part of the equation in a generic form as a fraction, as a ratio of two polynomials of S, Q of S and P of S. Q of S in this case is 1 and P of S is S times S plus 1. The parameter A is the parameter that is to be changed from 0 to infinity. So let's see what happens when A is tending to 0. This equation can be rewritten as p of s plus a q of s equals to zero. The solutions to these equations are the poles of the closed loop transfer function. When a tends to zero, this simplifies to p of s equals to zero, which means that when a tends to zero, the poles of the closed loop transfer function are the roots of p of s equals to zero. That is s times s plus one equals to zero, and the poles are s equals to 0 and s equals to minus 1. These are the poles of the closed loop transfer function when a tends to 0. What happens now if a tends to infinity? We can again rearrange this equation as p of s plus a times q of s equals to 0. Dividing everything by a results in p of s over a plus q of s equals to 0. And when a tends to infinity, this first term is 0 and we are left with q of s equals to zero. When the control parameter a tends to infinity, the poles will now migrate to solutions of q of s equals to zero. These are now the poles of the closed loop transfer function when the parameter a tends to infinity. Another way to do this analysis is to take the characteristic equation and solve for the values of the poles as the parameter a is changed. The characteristic equation is now written here as a function of a. Using the quadratic function, we can calculate the roots of this expression, which are the poles of the closed loop transfer function. Here we have the solution, and we see now that the location of poles will depend on the value of a. When a tends to zero, we are left with negative one half plus one half, which is zero, and negative one half minus one half, which is negative one. So the poles are here and here. As you now increase the value of a slightly, the poles will start to travel along the real axis. When a equals to 0 0.25, we are left with negative one half plus minus. The two poles are the same and they are located at negative one half. When a is greater than 0 0.25, then for a is greater than one, and you're left with a negative number inside of the square root, which means that this entire term results in an imaginary number. The poles now become complex conjugate numbers with a real part that is negative one half so right here, but now with imaginary parts that will travel to plus minus infinity as a keeps increasing. What can we conclude from this analysis? When a was greater than zero and less than 0 0.25, the poles were located on the real axis. The system was overdamped. When a equals to 0 0.25, then the two poles were equal to negative one half, the system was critically damped. And when a was greater than 0 0.25, the poles now become complex conjugate numbers and the system is under them. We can further say that this system is stable for all values of a greater than zero because the poles never cross into the unstable region. And this is the purpose of the root locus method, is to assess where these poles go as one of the parameters changes from zero to infinity.
we can now formally define the root locus method. To analyze the influence of a given parameter of interest k, the characteristic equation must be in the format 1 plus k, the parameter of interest, times a function of s, in this case, h of s equals to 0. k is the parameter of interest, h of s is a function of s. The root locus is a set of values of s for which 1 plus k times h of s equals to 0 is satisfied, as the real parameter k varies from 0 to infinity. This path in the s-plane, where the poles go as k is changed, is the root locus. But what if the characteristic equation is not written in the form we need, that is 1 plus k h of s equals to 0? For this example, the characteristic equation would be 1 plus 1 over s times s plus a equals to 0. And you need to write this in the form of 1 plus a times h of s equals to 0. First you, can rearrange these. First, you can rearrange the transfer function as s squared plus as plus 1 equals to 0. Now group all terms that are functions of a and terms that are not functions of a. In this case, s squared plus 1 is not a function of a, that's one term, and as is the other term that is not a function of a. So if we divide the entire function by s squared plus 1, we get a 1 plus a times s divided by s squared plus 1 equals to 0. This is now the characteristic equation in the standard form 1 plus k times h, which is the form we need for root locus analysis. We can also write this as 1 plus a times q of s divided by p of s equals to 0, where q of s is simply s and p of s is s squared plus 1. And now let's apply the same analysis we did before as as a goes from 0 to infinity. We can take this expression and rearrange it as p of s plus a q of s equals to 0. And when a tends to 0, the characteristic equation simplifies to p of s equals to 0. So the poles of the closed loop transfer function are the roots of p of s equals to 0. p of s equals to s squared plus 1. So s equals to plus minus 1j. And here they are. This is where the poles are located when a tends to 0. Now let's take this expression and rearrange it as p of s over a plus q of s equals to 0. And now let's make a tend to infinity. So this simplifies to q of s equals to 0. And now the pole is the roots of q of s equals to 0 q of s equals to s, so the pole is s equals to 0. And here it is. So here we have the map of the poles. As a tends to 0, we are here, and then the poles will slowly travel towards that 0, and the other pole will go towards negative infinity. We'll see how to draw this in more details in the upcoming slides. Now, now let's define mathematically the root locus. The root locus are the location of the roots of the characteristic equation, that is the poles of the closed loop transfer function as k goes from 0 to infinity. This expression gives k times g equals to, if you're dealing with a complex variable, you need to add the imaginary part, which is negative 1 plus 0j. If you now plot this on the s-plane, this is the imaginary part, this is the real part, negative 1 is right here, and if you now represent this as a vector, here is the vector. Here is the angle that the vector forms with the real axis, that is 180 degrees, and the magnitude is 1. To be part of the root locus, the magnitude of k times g needs to be 1, and the angle of g of s needs to be 180 degrees. That is what creates this negative sign, negative 1. If you now consider h of s as a new function equals to k times g of s, Let's call this h of s to avoid confusion, equals to k times a function of s. This is simply a ratio of different poles and zeros multiplied together, of n poles and m zeros. The magnitude requirement states that now the magnitude of this entire thing needs to be equal to 1. The magnitude of k is simply k. And for the function now, we can calculate the magnitude of all zeros, the magnitude of all poles, multiply all zeros, and divided by the multiplication of all poles, this is equal to 1. So writing magnitude this way equals to 1 
is the same as writing the magnitude of the individual zeros divided by the magnitude of the individual poles. And to satisfy the condition here, to satisfy 1 plus k times g equals to 0, this needs to be equal to 1. The second requirement is that the angle or the phase of function g of s needs to be 180 degrees or multiples of 180 degrees. The angle requirement can be obtained by calculating the angle of, of individual zeros, adding them up and subtracting the angle of all poles, as we see here. The angle of a zero minus the angle of all poles needs to be 180 degrees. To calculate the angle of this pole, for example, let's assume that this pole was S plus 5. We can replace S with sigma plus j omega. This becomes sigma plus 5 plus j omega. Sigma plus 5 is the real part, j omega is the imaginary part. We can now plot this on the imaginary axis. This is 5 plus sigma, and this would be omega. And this is the angle we are looking for. We can calculate this angle for every pole and zero, add the zero, subtract the poles, and this is the angle or the phase of function g of s. And that needs to be 180 degrees, so that it is part of the root locus. Now here is one example. Consider that our transfer function has a characteristic equation 1 plus w s equals to 0 or 1 plus k s plus 0 0.4 divided by s squared times s plus 3.6. So here we have g of s and this is equal to 0. The root locus are points where the magnitude of g of s times k is 1 and the angle of g of s is 180 degrees or multiples of 180 degrees. We have here one zero, so we can find the angle of that zero, and we have three poles, we can now subtract the angle of all poles. We have two poles at zero, here it is, and we have a pole at negative 3.6. Calculate the angle of that pole as well. We are doing angle of zeros minus angle of all poles, and this is equal to 180 degrees. Since s equals to j omega, simply replace this in the expression, and now we are left with the expanded ver version in equation 12. If you look at this zero specifically, we have a real part that is sigma plus 0 0.4, and we have the imaginary part of omega. The angle of that zero is here, theta is the arctangent of omega divided by sigma plus 0 0.4. And you can repeat this process with all poles as well. Now, if you continue this process, we get this big expression here. And this is actually the expression for the curve we see in the S-plane. Now, when you see a root locus, like this one, for example, you see that these curves are created by points along the path. And if you take any of these points, this point has a omega and has a sigma. If you input this point, this value of sigma and omega, into this expression, this needs to be 180 degrees. Basically, the root locus is the graphical representation of this function here. From our previous discussion, the root locus can be obtained by sweeping through every point in the S-plane to locate those points for which the angles of the characteristic equation add up to an odd multiple of 180 degrees. Although this task is tedious without the aid of a computer, the concept can be used to develop rules that can help plot the root locus. The following 10 rules allow us to sketch the root locus using minimal calculations. The rules yield a sketch that gives intuitive insight into the behavior of control system. In the next lecture, we will refine this sketch by finding actual points or angle on the root locus. The first rule has to do with the number of branches in a root locus. Each closed loop pole moves as a gain is changed. If we define a branch as the path that one pole traverses, then there will be one branch for each closed loop pole. Our first rule then defines the number of branches of the root locus to be equal to the number of closed loop poles. Mathematically, we can define rule 1 as, as k varies from 0 to infinity, there are n lines on the root locus, where n is the degree of q or p, whichever is greater. The second rule states that as k varies from 0 to infinity, the roots of the characteristic equation move from the poles of g of s, when, that is, when p of s equals to 0, to the zeros of h of s, that is, when q of s equals to 0. Remember that this expression can be rearranged in this format, and when k equals to 0, 
then the poles will satisfy p of s equals to zero. The poles of the characteristic equation are now the poles of g of s. When k tends to infinity, rearrange the expression like this, and when k tends to infinity, this term tends to zero, we are left with q of s equals to zero. This means that for, for k tending to infinity, the poles of the closed loop transfer function are the zeros of g of s. The poles move from the poles of g of s towards the zeros of g of s. If you now take our function g of s and plot the poles and zeros of it here, we know that a pole goes to the zero when k equals to zero with the root locus is here, and when k tends to infinity, the root locus is there. Again, this path represents the path of the closed loop transfer function poles for that range of k. Now, an interesting note here is that for this very specific case, where we have a unit feedback loop and a control gain to be changed in this way, the transfer function is k times g times 1 over k times g. The characteristic equation is 1 plus k times g of s equals to 0. And in this particular case only, we consider the poles of the closed loop transfer function. We will start at the poles of g of s, that is, the poles of the open loop transfer function, and they will migrate towards the zeros of the g of s, that is, the zeros of the open loop transfer function. For this specific arrangement with a feedback loop and when the gain is explicit here, now the root locus will give us a method of finding the closed loop poles based on the open loop zeros and pole. Rule number three deals with symmetry. If complex closed loop poles do not exist in conjugate pairs, the resulting polynomial forming by multiplying the factors containing the closed loop poles wouldn't have complex coefficients. Physically realizable system cannot have complex coefficients in their transfer functions. Thus, we conclude that the root locus is symmetric about the real axis. Simply state, the root locus must be symmetrical with respect to the horizontal real axis. Rule number four states that a root locus cannot cross its own path. The figure on the left will never happen, because this would mean that for a given value of k, we may have more than one possible solution to the characteristic equation. And this is a characteristic of a nonlinear system. So this does not apply here. The root locus never crosses its path. Rule number five states that the loci are on the real axis to the left of a non number of poles and zeros. The root locus only exists to the left of a non number of poles and zeros. And this is because of the angle requirement. The root locus cannot exist to the right of an odd number of poles and zeros because that gives an angle of zero. It needs to be on the left of odd number of poles and zeros. To find segments of the real axis that are to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros, we can start counting from plus infinity and move towards negative infinity. In this example here, the count from plus infinity up to this point, the count of poles and zeros, is zero past that pole, now the count is 1, because we counted one pole. So the root locus needs to exist in this part of the real axis only, and there is nothing on the right side because the count there is even. In the second example, where is the root locus? You start counting from positive infinity and go towards negative infinity. Up to this pole, the count is 0. From this pole to that 0, now the count of poles and zeros is 1. Past that 0, the count now becomes 2, and past that pole, the count becomes 3. Where is the root locus? To the left of an odd number of poles and zeros, that is, between this pole and the zero, and to the left of that pole. Where would the root locus be in this last example? Let's add another pole here. Counting from plus infinity, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the root locus exists here and here, only the odd parts of this count. Next rule is very simple to understand. Lines leave, break out, and enter, break in the real axis at a 90 degree angle. Rule number seven states that if there are different numbers of poles and zeros, extra poles or zeros that do not have a pair to go to will go or come from infinity. Let's see example one. In this example, the root locus exists to the left of that pole, and there are no zeros for that pole to go to. So it goes to infinity. 
In a second example, there are two poles and no zeros. Remember our expression 1 plus k times p of s over q of s equals to 0. When we start, the poles start at q of s equals to 0 and goes towards the 0 of g of s, that is p of s equals to 0. But what if there are no zeros or there are no poles? The excess of poles will go to infinity. The excess of zeros will come from infinity. In the second example, we have two more poles than zeros. And you see that these poles will meet at a given point and go to infinity because they don't have a zero to go to. In the last example, we have two zeros, two poles and one zero. One of the poles will go to the zero and the other pole will go to negative infinity. Rule 8 states that the angle of the asymptotes of the curves that go to infinity, that take poles to infinity or zeros from infinity, is given here as 180 plus 360 times q minus 1 divided by n minus m. m is the number of zeros of g of s, n is the number of poles of g of s, which means that n minus m is the number of unmatched poles, poles that don't have a zero to go to. For each pole that it doesn't have a zero to go to, we have a line going to infinity, and the angle of that line is given in equation 14. Q is an integer that goes from 1 to n minus m. In this case here, we have three poles and no zeros. n minus m equals to 3. Q equals to 1, 2, and 3. So now replacing Q in this expression, we'll have theta 1 as... 180 plus minus 360 times q which is 1 minus 1 divided by 3 this is 60 degrees theta 2 is a, is obtained when q equals to 2 that is 180 plus minus 360 times q which is 2 minus 1 divided by 3 this is 180 degrees and theta 3, if you calculate, will be 300 degrees or negative 60 degrees. Rule 8 further states that the centroid of these asymptotes can be calculated through equation 15. The centroid of the asymptotes, in this case, is here. We have these three asymptotes. One goes up on an angle of 60 degrees. The other one goes down on an angle of negative 60 degrees or 300 degrees. And the third one goes to negative infinity following an angle of 180 degrees. All the centroids will meet at point alpha, that is the centroid of the asymptotes, and they can be calculated by simply adding all poles, subtracting all zeros, and dividing that by n minus m. So this point, the centroid, can be calculated as well. Rule 9 is a rule that will not necessarily help us draw the root locus, but it can be useful in a design process. It states that if there are at least two lines that go to infinity, then the sum of all the roots is constant. This has practical applications in case, for instance, we have complex poles and a real pole. If we increase k, the real root moves to the left twice as fast as the conjugate poles will approach the imaginary axis. And rule number 10 states that if k sweeps from 0 to negative infinity instead of 0 to plus infinity, the root locus can be drawn by reversing rule 5, which means that the root locus exists to the right of another number of poles and zeros, and by adding 180 degree to each of the asymptote angles. This will rarely be used because this implies a positive feedback loop. Now there are a lot of rules to remember and a lot of analysis here. We are going to do several exercises in this lecture. I recommend you go through every single one of them. In the next lecture, we'll see how to refine the root locus. So the concepts covered in this lecture must be very clear before we move on to lecture 12. Thank you.